my real pleasure and honor to be uh, part of the, the Bear um, Lecture Series. Um, obviously, following on the distinguished footsteps of Richard Baker, who is the first Bear uh, speaker, um, the areas that he's covered is very well talking to you about membrane processes. And today, I'm going to talk about membrane processes, but a little bit more focus on materials. So first, I want to uh, start by um, Say, where is the new university in New South Wales and Sydney? I think I only need to show you one slide about where we are, 15 minutes away from the beach and, and the centre of Sydney. We're a very large university, over 40,000 students. Um, in that respect, we are a very large multidisciplinary school um, covering membranes, um, as this part in, in, in environmental technology, but also a very wide range of groups from macromolecular colloids to health to uh, uh, energy. So the UNESCO Membrane Centre is a very long um, standing centre, over 30 years old, um, and founded by uh, Chris Fell, Tony Fain and Hans Costa. And we, it's really spanning a lot of tech membrane technology, particularly in environmental technology. So we want to, uh, this is one of the areas that we particularly uh, have a uh, great deal of focus on. So today I want to talk to you about some of the challenges that we generally chase as, as a global community in the environmental technology area and some of the new membrane materials and processes that we're working on within our, our group. So of course one of the challenges is water, both in terms of looking at new alternative sources but also water quality issues. We have contamination from pathogens but also chemical contamination, uh, contamination of uh, chemicals of concern and of crime disruptors and things like that. Um, the other, however, one of the new areas of emerging in terms of quality, water quality uh, treatment is also in, in terms of brines. How we have concentrates coming out of our membrane processes, reverse osmosis and others, which now need to be disposed of. And these uh, formerly were done in injection, evaporation ponds, but the critical things is can we do more with that and how can we dispose of that more sustainably? sustainably? Oops, sorry. The other emerging challenges, especially in water, are things I mentioned, concentrate disposal. It's costing us now potentially to, dis to dispose of the concentrate of our membrane processes as much as to actually treat it. The recalcitrant micropollutants, as I mentioned before, residual organic matter removal. Once you get to very small uh, levels of organics, um, you still have issues with disinfection byproduct. How do you get that last bit of humic acid out without going to full re or resource osmosis? I mentioned hypersaline brines. And one of the things is also resource recovery. Can we cover valuable mineral salts, such as lithium, um, uh, uh, other valuable minerals from those brines, which are environmentally? And finally, a lot of work interest now in going to total zero liquid discharge. So those are some of the challenges in terms of the water uh, point of view. If you look at greenhouse emissions, we typically think of stationary sources, power plants, etc. But there's also others, fugitive emissions, industrial process, agriculture. Now a lot of the work that's been, been done is really on carbon capture and storage. But we are now going to, in the future, thinking about also cap and car cap and carbon capture and conversion. And that's a very challenging but a very uh, interesting place to go. So I'll, I won't have a lot of time to talk about the conversion issue, but I will talk a little bit about uh, things that we're doing in terms of carbon capture inter with membranes. So the scope that I'm going to talk about today is, as I said, gas separation and water treatment. Uh, specifically on CO2 capture, but we're also doing a lot of other work in the biocatalytic uh, processes for CO2 capture. In the water treatment, we have brines. Um, I will talk specifically about this. The others we also are doing work in, but I won't have time to, to go through them. But the biocatalytic membrane is also a combination of membrane contactors and enzymes. So part of the work was done uh, recently in our group, and we're also moving into for example, encapsulating some of those enzymes that capture CO2 into moths and other uh, nanomaterials. So today, I, for a few minutes, I'm going to cover, uh, touch upon a few areas I think of interest that look at some of the slightly different ways of functionalizing membrane, developing new membranes uh, for these processes. So 
Let's look at the commonality in, in, in developing membranes. First of all, we have issues with chemical stability. We need scalability of manufacture. We need integration with the existing systems. And this is very important in terms of talking about how membranes will be targeted for specific CO2 capture. It's not a silver bullet membrane that does everything high selectivity, high permeance. It's got to fit into the overall CO2 uh, uh, process train. Other things are thin films. Are they just barriers? Are they reactive? Do they have uh, self-cleaning functionalities, some of the new areas? And also membrane integrity, you know, defects, validation. Those are some of the challenges of developing new membrane materials that are beyond just simply synthesizing of next wonderful um, uh, nano uh, particles. So in terms of surface and uh, memory modification, we can talk about looking at wonderful uh, uh, membrane structures. So see are some of the isoporous membrane. Okay. They're wonderful, but not scalable. And in fact, when we look at the um, separation, they don't actually give that much additional separation capability. They're I said, beautiful as, a, as an image, but one of the, I said, in terms of application, uh, a little bit less. But what's really useful are more like things that how can we actually integrate materials that gives you self-cleaning functionality and things like anti-fouling, anti-release, uh, low energy material. How do we integrate that into uh, membranes for uh, water treatment? Nanocomposite membranes are the ones that I'm going to focus on today because they basically are giving us a different handle, a different levers for us to tailor membrane materials in a way that we haven't been able to do so in the conventional um, uh, polymer synthesis. So the opportunity now are even looking at hybrid materials. I'm talking organic, inorganic uh, composite. And what we want is usually when you talk about nanocomposite, you're looking at mechanical strength, thermal stability. But really thinking about, are there better ways to improve separation and permeability, uh, both chemical and mechanical stability? And as I said, it gives us another lever to change the membrane properties. So the approaches people have done in terms of either additive um, blending, but that has issues with agglomeration. If you just simply add uh, nanoparticles and nanomaterials, limited surface accessibility, we can form these nanomaterials or uh, inorganic uh, constituents at the interface. So, but that requires some reactive agents or, or with controlling where they form. And finally, we can think about how we can actually do nanoposite membranes layer by layer. And this is a little bit different from the normal way that we think about nanocomposite membranes. Oops, let's go back here. So let's look at the type of fillers we're thinking about. We can have, think about 1D material, um, halicide nanotubes is an example, carbon nanotubes are another. These are functionalized clays. We have 2D materials like graphene oxide, one of the people's favorite uh, tubes. And we have 3D materials, framework material with, with uh, ordered structures. And these are, have ability to control your aperture size, um, things like ZIF-7, ZIF-8. But also we have things like UIO66, which is a metal organic framework with a lot of functionalities. I've been able to functionalize with different properties. So I'll talk about some of the consequences of some of those function functionalization. Now, I'll start first by looking at the water area. So in the water treatment area, we have several very important uh, uh, applications. As I said the cleaning, self-cleaning application, making surfaces. But we also have issues in terms of, can we make um, a, a new types of membranes for water treatment that are a composite of uh, inorganic coatings, not just blended in components, that are super hydrophilic, super hydrophobic, and we also can functionalize them to biocatalytic. We won't have time to go through this particular piece of work, but it is an area that we, we are um, particularly interested in combining enzymes with uh, functionalized membrane surfaces. So, in the area of anti-fouling, most of the people have looked at grafting um, uh, surface functionality. But one of the things is that is often quite difficult from the manufacturing point of view. Post-fabrication grafting, most membrane materials are mechanically and chemically stable. And they're, therefore, you have to use quite extreme conditions to get that functional groups and enough density to give you um, uh, 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 surface functionality. What we want to do is 
looking another way. We can add materials that self-segregate to the surface. So we can have low energy blocks with tethering polymer change that these spontaneously surface segregate during the phase inversion process, driven by the thermodynamics of, of uh, solubility, relative solubilities of the different groups. And these allow us to then have basically blend these materials without changing the manufacturing process um, and allow us to not use as much because these all enrich at the surface. So this is part of the work that we did with uh, BASF. The other way is tethering these uh, uh, clean these uh, hydrophilic or, or low energy components onto a, 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 a nanoparticles. Again, these will also spontaneously um, surface segregate. So do these work? Well, in fact, one of the things that they've actually now done is upscale this particular technology. They've developed, BASF developed a, a range of, a library of these materials. They've put it in uh, capillary membranes, and you can see here, uh, without the version material, you get a continuous drop in and a flux over time with these low fouling retail, you still don't get a complete self-cleaning, but you get much better fouling resistance and fouling release. And this is quite critical. Many people focus on the fouling, initial fouling. What you really want is fouling release, ability to clean. That's even more important in most cases than simply the first instance of fouling. So this is part of the work that has been actually starting to be translated um, into uh, practical uh, applications. Now, the second technology I want to talk about is membrane distillation. Now, membrane distillation was very fashionable about 20, 30, 25 years ago, but in fact, it's come back again. And one of the things is membrane distillation basically involves um, uh, a, a moderately hot street, feed water stream, a hydrof uh, a permeate stream, which is under either cold water or, or a vacuum, and basically you've got a hydrophobic membrane, which is a, a liquid barrier. And what you have is basically water vapor going from one side to the other while re rejecting the contaminant. So why is this particular uh, application important? Well, the applications now coming up is comes back to the fact that we're treating much more recalcitrant streams now. It's not just sea, clean seawater. We're talking about industrial wastewater. We're talking about things with 100 to 200 grams per liter salt concentration. That's not something you can do with reverse osmosis. Um, we have scaling, we've got osmotic pressure issues. The second thing is the interest now in using renewable and low value heat, which is um, from solar, geothermal, or actually just from uh, waste heat from power plants, and inland uh, remote commuted heat sources. So this allows us to really start to concentrate those brines and actually produce fresh water um, using, as I said, relatively, uh, without going to, to high uh, energy, high uh, valuable energy usage. Now, the problem is, of course, you've got wetting and fouling is still the issue, because as we increase the concentration to very high degrees, we could get scaling, we could get wetting. So we look closely at the interface as we increase the concentration on the feed side, we get precipitation from especially divalent salts, and of course, what that allows us then is that hydrophobic membrane will come eventually wet out, and you get contamination. So the approach that we want to do, and it, as I said, it can be as severe as getting uh, full-on crystal growth. In fact, these membranes still survive, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. These membranes are recoverable. But how do we actually overcome that? So first of all, we can make the membrane more hydrophobic. We can. So what we can do is take a, a page from nature and think about we can roughen the surface, make hierarchically rough surfaces, and make them super and make them super hydrophobic. So one of the most famous examples is the lotus leaf, which has a, a, a dual hierarchical structure, a, mac, a sort of a micron type structure, and, and then a, a submicron, and you can see a very, very high contact angle. Now, it's hydrophobic because it's got wax-like particles. How can we actually replicate something that that kind of structure on a membrane surface? So what we do is actually have a thought, we thought about it and say, well, can we actually coat a polymeric membrane with uh, a sol gel um, uh, solution? That sol gel solution would actually crystallize under very low hydrothermal, just basically hot water treatment, and basically form basically a titania crust on the surface. 
So what we see here is the, the membrane now covered with this ultra-thin titanium um, surface functionalization. What's really interesting, if you think this is being very brittle, it's actually because it's so thin, it's actually quite flexible. And the second thing, we get this dual hierarchical roughness. It's actually robust, I can bend the membrane, and it turns out to be photocatalytic. We don't use that functionality, but it, it actually exists as well. So with that dual hierarchical structure, we can actually play around with the architecture by using different templating agent in a sol gel solution. So that gives it quite a different lever in terms of the surface architecture that we can achieve. Now, we can now take that dual hierarchical structure and we can functionalize it by putting a, uh, making that super hydrophobic um, surface by putting a silane group. So we've taken our commercial PVDF membrane, polymer membrane, we've uh, done this, this roughening due to titanium dioxide, and we now put a floor height silane coating and now being able to achieve much higher contact angles. So we can see here that here's a, a water, a humic acid, another a solution, lovely beating up on our membrane surface. And this is easily translatable to being hollow fibers, flat sheets, so it's not, depend, it's not very heavily dependent on, on morphology. Okay, so as I said, we've done this uh, coding technology. We, we've taken, now taken this, we now made this rather inert surface now functionalized with a, basically it's imitating a ceramic membrane um, in terms of its chemistry. We have those lovely hydroxyl groups. We can do a condensation reaction and, and get our silane groups on and we can achieve our, our super hydrophobicity. Now, this now shows you a way that in terms of rather than simply doing chemical grafting, we can now, as I say, have a polymer membrane with aspect of a ceramic membrane surface chemistry and the functionalization that you have with a ceramic membrane a functionalization. So that allows us to uh, get a chemically and mechanically uh, a, a robust surface and allows us to think about what other things that we can put on that, that surface. The other thing is quite interesting is that when we do this coating, we also change the way that salt crystallizes on the surface. If it's a virgin membrane, we get much more heterogeneous salt crystal forming. With this titanium surface, we actually get uh, much more even um, crystallization. Later on, this will be important because we, we will use this for a different application. But the other thing is this, the salts actually will peel off the surface much more easily. They actually are released much more easily from that uh, super hydrophobic uh, titanium coated surface. So it's one of the very interesting uh, side effects of, of surface uh, texturization as well as, as a chemical uh, change. Now we can also play this game in the same way it's, it's called uh, biomineralization. Um, instead of using um, uh, the titanium substrate, we can use things like uh, polyethylamine and uh, polydothamine to produce uh, catechol groups on the surface that interacts with inorganic precursors such as silica. We can then uh, functionalize those with, um, with uh, fluorosilane. We can also get uh, super hydrophobic surfaces that way. So it's another way of saying you can change the architecture and play around with giving you a, say, a, a much different surface without having to go to a chemical grafting or covalent uh, bonding. Now, the challenges of working with brine, as I said, 100 to 200 grams per liter is, is extremely, now, extremely tough, especially if you have um, sc highly scaling components. So if you are working with a lot of calcium and other divalent, the, the, eventually those crystal, you can see the, how severely those crystallization processes can foul the membrane, can actually then wet the membrane too. So one of the things we consider is if we wanted to protect the membrane, let's just go all the way to the dense film surface. And in fact, um, what we have is we coat the membrane with dense film here is polyvinyl alcohol again. And now, um, like the other case, instead we're gonna use vacuum to, to pull the liquid water from the other side. Sorry, the water vapor from the other side. So we now have a solution diffusion process, not a water, a vapor, a va water vapor transport process. Now, the, the same principle uh, in terms of using a uh, low uh, hot feed, 
65. But we are working, as I say, quite challenging concentrations, 100 grams, 200 grams per liter. So, so this process for evaporation has been around for a long time, but most people use it for dehydration of organic um, solvents. Here, basically, we're sorbing water from the hot feed and then um, at this interface vaporizing it. Now, we found that even with a dense film with cross-linked polyvinyl alcohol, we were still getting some salt, hydrated salt actually diffusing through. So what we did was actually say, well, is there, can we put other barriers? We might compromise the flux, but can we put other barriers to, to kind of rigidify that, those uh, polymer chains? So we added graphene oxide, and surprisingly, rather than just simply dropping the flux, we didn't get much flux drop, but in fact, what we did was we got suppression of the salt uh, migration, which is, and this is at um, not perhaps up to 10% of the, um, sorry, only 0.3 weight percent in the, uh, in the uh, uh, coating uh, material. So it's really quite interesting. When you add in, the, add in these nanopaterials, it's not just simply they're using as porous fillers. They have some interaction with the, the polymers um, to, as I say, basically instead of cross-linking this with a, just simply adding the more, more um, uh, longer reaction times by putting a graphene oxide, you're actually uh, having, as I say, hydrogen bonding and other interaction between the nanofillers and the polymer. And this is something, uh, one of the themes I'll talk about is when we think about nanofillers, think of them as just putting like a, a, a porous material. They have quite strong interactions with the bulk polymer and that has some consequences that perhaps is not uh, foreseen. So if we look at that to say, well, how else can we improve the water permeation in these particular um, uh, evaporation processes? So one of the things that we use is a metal organic framework material. Now, metal organic framework is simply um, organic ligands coordinated uh, with a, uh, through, through metal, uh, 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 sorry, metal co coordinated organic ligands. Okay, here we're using uh, MIL-53, which is a fumic acid uh, aluminum uh, coordinated framework material. Now that makes a nice tight material. It's, it's hydrophilic. It's, but one of the things is, can we actually improve on that? Because when we have a dense metal organic framework, we have some sorption of water, but it's not a very efficient sorption of water into the bulk of the material. So one of the things that we can do in the metal organic framework areas is actually what they call defect engineering. We can etch out parts of that metal organic framework material so you can make these pores more accessible. And you can, using urea heat in this case. So we found was you can actually section um, the, the untreated um, uh, material. We can find that we have, in fact, quite dense um, pat uh, patches of metal organic framework, but and then here we have the uh, the defect engineered basically with the the moths in the green and the uh, and the voids in the in the purple area. So one of the things is we use uh, I'll say result just fresh off the the shelf two days ago is using focus ion beam to allow us to section those particular materials to show us the distribution and the density of those materials in that uh, polyvinyl alcohol. So what we found is when we put these sorts of material in, we can increase our fluxes for 30 to 50%. So the presence of that defect engineer material allows us to improve not just um, uh, the permeability, but in fact, we get, in fact, ability to, to um, suppress the uh, the salt processes. So are these things robust? So one of the things that people have concerns about metal organic framework is they are, can they stand up to, um, to are they water uh, uh, resistant, sorry, not water tolerant in terms of stability? And what we can show you here that we were actually running about 150 hours um, and we are using 100 grams per liter salt and with the presence of humic acids, presence of calcium, we can wash this membrane and we can get recovery and the flux declines because we're, we're uh, concentrating, uh, uh, continuously concentrating the feed. But it is actually quite a robust uh, system. And as I said, we're looking at a very, very high 
salt concentrate. So you can look at the, the conductivity. It's ultra low conductivity. And you, you, off, you do not often see that kind of salt rejection with these sorts of types of, of membranes. So this shows you the strategy that, in fact, when we think about uh, treating brines, um, the challenges of scaling and trying to drive to the point of, of uh, crystallization requires we have quite robust membranes. And here's perhaps a generation of membrane that can actually be able to tolerate that kind of, uh, of uh, challenge. So some of the areas we're working on uh, in the ongoing, I don't have time to cover, is really to compare these against pure graphene oxide membranes for pervaporation. Graphene oxide has really interesting transport properties in terms of um, in, in the hydrated form, but when we put them in a pervaporation um, situation, we have a, a combination of vapor transport as well as a swollen uh, graphene oxide layer. So one of the things that we are looking at now is looking at what are the mechanisms potentially of that transfer from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about our work in gas separation. Now just a little bit of background. Um, you think about gas, membrane gas separation is pretty much driven up. We're looking at pressure-driven gas separation, um, typically in hollow fibers or a spa around the conventional modules. Um, and most of the gas separation is in the solution diffusion uh, approach, where you have an integrally skinned membrane, very tight, ultra-thin membrane uh, separation with a, uh, a porous or, or, or support to give you the mechanical strength. Okay. Now, these materials can be, of course, both polymer and organic materials, but we'd like to say, can we actually achieve the best of both worlds? Inorganic materials have issues of brittleness and also cost. Polymeric materials are limited by the uh, uh, solution diffusion um, mechanism. So if we want to achieve both cost reduction and performance in gas separation, we want to think about two aspects, the permeability, which is materials project, and our, uh, the name lecture very, comes into defining the permeability of the materials, but that's actually um, scaled to thickness. But what we really want in terms of productivity, we want the pressure normalized flux, which is actually in gas permeation units. Now, th normally you see this, this uh, graph, which is selectivity versus permeability, and the famous Robeson plot where it says polymeric materials in the solution diffusion mechanism. It, basically um, line up roughly controlled by, uh, by the relative uh, permeability and, and selectivity. But we really want to think about in terms of application and cost is basically the selectivity and the permeance, which is the productivity, the flux of the membrane that you can achieve. There's been a lot of work looking at what is the optimal flux and selectivity because you, you can, even if you get too selective, it becomes a problem in terms of designing the module design and the, the process train. So it's not simply saying that we want complete huge selectivities and huge uh, permeability simultaneously um, is going to answer all your problems. So there's people looking at, well, what are the areas of interest? So the areas that are in probably are in about the 40 in terms of CO2 nitrogen selectivity if you're looking at treating things like flue gas. And the permeance is probably around the several hundred thousand GPUs. Now this has been done in some respect in flat sheet membranes, but it's been actually quite difficult to do in hollow fiber membranes. So my takeaway here, which I think will answer, uh, answer is thickness matters because many people Talk about permeability, wonderful materials of permeability, but they can only make it in 100, 200 nat, uh, micron thicknesses. So in terms of practical productivity, it's extremely um, uneconomical and diff difficult to scale. So thickness matters. When you think about how we can actually get that thickness down with using a material that is cost effective and scalable. So the approach that we typically people use gas separation is, you, of course, pure polymer materials, uh, spinning, so you get the ultra-thin, ultra-tight selective layers. We're going to talk about nanocomposite material, which is basically using a nice porous support, allowing us to use much more uh, mechanically weaker material, but maybe much better separation processes. And finally, I'm going to talk about growing pure net organic framework type of material on top of a polymer material.
So when you talk about let's say, reducing costs and, and increasing employment, the conventional way to think about it is take your dense uh, polymeric material, add the inorganic material or the, the other um, nanomaterials, and you're using basically uh, chunks of that material. And I, I call this the, the chocolate chip cookie. Uh, so you get benefits of the uh, nanomaterials on, or, uh, or inorganic material, but you don't necessarily get all of the benefit. You have people who grow these dense um, inorganic or, or um, other new bit on top of a dense inorganic material, but often that they can be quite thick. And again, uh, but it's a much more rigid support, so you get the, uh, a good balance. But what we really would like to think in terms of costs, can we actually have an ultra thin layer where those nanomaterials are confined to a very thin separation layer and use a micropore support to give you that mechanical stability? So we're looking in terms of robustness, but we're also looking at scalable fabrication. Um, mass transfer control and the module footprint because the membrane material may be only 10% of the cost of the whole process. You think about modulization, the headers, the, the pumps, the, uh, the pipe work will probably swamp the cost of the, of the membrane materials itself. So this is quite important in terms of the whole uh, membrane module cost, not just simply the membrane cost. So in order to get that ultra thin layer, we really need a submicron mechanically stable um, MOFs or other nanocomposite materials, and that means looking at 1D, 2D, 3D material in the very small particle size or confined into very, very thin layers. So one of the other challenges anytime you add uh, these nanomaterials is that you've got issues with uh, voids and uh, uh, forming compatibility is really important, potential blockage of the interface, for example, in the mineral organic framework materials is also a concern. So we need to think about compatibilization of those materials as well. So today I'm going to talk about uh, looking at a couple strategies we've used and to give you slightly different types of membrane, um, nanocomposite uh, membranes for gas separation. One is to look at layer by layer uh, coatings to give you that ultra thin scalable uh, membranes. The second is are there strategies we grow inorganic um, layers on top of the membrane uh, structure and still get that ga gas uh, sieving uh, performance? Now, in terms of composite membrane, it's really a very simple, uh, um, it's taking basically a porous substrate and coating it with a uh, gutter layer. Gutter layer prevents penetration of a, uh, the, the uh, separation layer. And what we're going to use is uh, PBAX, which is, which is a Black polymer with polyamide and PEO select. The PEO has a very high selectivity for CO2. The polyamide gives a little bit more rigidity. Um, and the gutter layer we use is a PTMS, PTMSP, which prevents basically the selective layer wetting through the whole thickness of the, uh, the membrane. Now, this is quite important to think about, once we're starting to use these sort of block copolymers, these are sensitive to microphase separation. So if you look at the, uh, this is AFM, depending on the solvent you use, the drying condition, you can get quite different um, uh, microphase separation between the hard polyamide block and the, and the PEO block. And that depends, as I said, it, and that c can change the, both the, separa the separation efficiency as well as the permeation. So now when we think about putting a nanofiller into that mix, that will also change those microphase separation potentially. Now these membranes have quite good selectivity, polymers have good quite selectivity on their own right. The other thing about PVAX is really nice is that I can actually cast this out of alcohol water solution. So it's actually quite a, a green polymer um, uh, fabrication process. So what are the things that we can, can do to tweak the performance of these uh, block copolymers? As I said, I mentioned uh, halocyte nanotubes. One of the things that uh, is about basically aluminum silicate uh, nano, uh, rolled clays, essentially, except they're, they're uh, much, much smaller. And what people have found with my colleague, uh, um, P Professor Yato Zhang, is when they actually suspend those halocyte nanotube solution and they just do uh, um, uh, drop casting, 
over time, those halocyanin nanotubes actually will migrate to the surface and form quite a, quite a dense uh, uh, layer of those halocyanin on the surf nanotubes on the surface. Now, these halocyanin nanotubes have inter interesting inter um, uh, layer spacings, um, which can or can is on order of, of uh, 10 nanometers in the middle and about seven angstroms in between the layers. So it was in the back of my well, what is the transport process? Is it through those interlayers or, you know, obviously it can't be through, if there's going to be any selectivity, it can't be through the, the lumen because those are way too big for any selective processes. What is quite interesting is when they actually add those calcine nanotubes, we went from a selectivity about 40 to a selectivity of over 200. Okay. Now, this is not a lot of, we're not adding a lot of halocyte nanotubes. So this is quite a dramatic increase in terms of, of selectivity. Um, we thought, well, is it the high packing density? Is it, is, are, they, are this flow going through those inter the clay uh, lumen silicate nanolayer? But actually, when we actually disperse this halocyte nanotubes in randomly and actually put in a dip coated uh, under hollow fiber membrane, although we get, didn't get such a huge increase in selectivity, we still went from 40 to 120 um, in terms of CO2 nitrogen selectivity. So it's n not just the fact that they have that surface segregation. What we think is those halocyte nanotubes are, have somehow changed the, inter the as I say, the the macrophase separation of the PBACs. Um, so the, their range of influence is actually much higher than the, the amount that we're just putting in into these PBACs uh, membranes. Interesting, if you're just simply looking at the permeability and selectivity, these, the addition of those halocyte nanotubes would push the, uh, per the uh, selectivity, of course, way beyond the ropes and Bound. But I would just say, you know, are we really talking about Robeson bound? Because it's not a heterogeneous, uh, sorry, a homogeneous uh, material. You have a basic, a, a surface segregated, um, uh, uh, layered uh, structure. So this is quite interesting that putting in these nano um, materials can have a zone of influence much higher than just their, their volume fraction. The other er thing that we can do is put a 2D material, and graphene oxide has been used uh, quite uh, frequently in, the, in much of the literature. So we thought about thinking about, well, if we put a 2D materials, graphene oxide is not specifically, um, uh, we think about that as a barrier rather than a, uh, a necessarily a, a, a CO2 uh, um, a selective material. But what we found is uh, the gas transport through those uh, interlayer structures, the geo um, laminates, are much faster than the solution diffusion. So if we disperse this material in thick membranes, it doesn't really matter so much in terms of the orientation. But once we start to, as I said, try to push down the membrane thickness, those, the alignment of those layers become critical, right? Because you start to get potential for defects and other issues. Now, Putting that ultra-thin um, uh, geo in the ultra-thin layer, or do it by, say, uh, dip coating. So we're basically um, uh, coating the surface, uh, just pulling it out and allowing the, the, the surface film to drain. We get quite a, really quite an incredible increase in terms of mechanical stability. So this is just a, a submicron layer of polymer plus graphene oxide, and you get just the addition of that graphene oxide increases the mechanical uh, robustness of that membrane enormously. What's really also, if you actually now look at the, um, closely at the, the graphene oxide, you notice here at the right uh, coating conditions, you can actually get those graphene oxide to align parallel to the surface. Now that turns out to be quite important because, as I said, if you have mis a crumpling of those graphene oxide, you actually start to induce defects. And we see that if we add too much graphene oxide or we don't have the right coating um, speed. So the graphene oxide, we can increase, for example, we can almost double the permeance of the CO2 in these membranes while still maintaining the uh, selectivity. If we put in too much graphene oxide, we start to get aggregation. This is often the main problem with nanomaterials high loadings, you get 
uh, get aggregation and then again defects starting to come up. So, you, so how do we actually get the alignment? Well, one of the things that we explored is basically changing the withdrawal speed during the coding. So it's basically like a pure hydrodynamic issue. Um, if we get the stagnation point of the draining fluid to be slightly smaller than the lateral size of the graphene oxide, they actually are pulled by the, um, the surface tension into parallel on the surface. If the stagnation point what's in the coating is too big, the, la the graphene oxide layers can actually tumble and crumple and you start to get a defect. So this is really a hydrodynamic issue about coating rather than uh, uh, chemical issues. So we get uh, a compromise between uh, uh, permeance and selectivity and we get some kind of optimal, as I said, with uh, being able to go from uh, a very high permeance but really low selectivity to sort of, as I say, maintaining your selectivity close to what the polymer um, matrix is but much higher uh, but being able to still have significantly enhanced permeance of the CO2. So you can play a lot of games with these sorts of material. You can actually functionalize the graphene oxides. Some of the things we're doing is, uh, for example, coupling with uh, ionic liquids to improve the permeance of the CO2. But it turns out that, that ionic liquids can also functionalize graphene oxide. And basically, you can get, again, you start to be able to push up the performances of these composite membranes up to, as I said, the 1,000 GPU, still maintaining very good uh, selectivity. Um, with these sorts of composite membrane. All right, so now we have, as I said, I've shown you 1D material, I've shown you 2D materials. Now we're going to come back to our, our framework 3D materials. Most of the approaches in terms of uh, using these middle organic framework, other 3D zeolites and things, is really what they call the mixed matrix uh, membranes. Basically, you just put the membrane, you just put suspensions into the solvents, and you just cast as a thick sheet and you get some improvement in the performance, but not usually uh, much in terms of um, selectivity. What we found is that with putting things like zip 8 you get a uh, slight decrease in the selectivity. We think it's because there are still some issues with my defect. But the other thing to think about is some of these metal organic frames are not like crystals. They have organic ligands. They actually have a little bit of flex in them, right? So when we go to... Uh, uh, we start to pressurize these things, we may be causing us uh, either producing a voice or are we actually causing some changes in the aperture um, size of some of these metal organic framework. So with more rigid ones, as I said, we don't see the slight loss in selectivity. So with the ZIF-7, so it's not a, a compared to the, the, the zif eight. So this is quite in, important for you to think about these framework materials as not quite like crystals. They're kind of an intermediate between soft and hard um, framework. So the interesting thing is to take, so ZIF-7, oh, sorry, ZIF-8 gives you increase in permeability, but not much increased selectivity, but ZIF-8 doesn't have much intrinsic um, selectivity of CO2 over nitrogen. However, if we now move to the UIO-66 with the zirconium uh, coordinated framework. You can functionalize those with carboxyl groups and avian groups. And what we find is when you add those materials, you can get both the increase in selectivity and an increase in permeance. So, and because of the functionalization, you can get up to extremely high uh, particles loading. And because we're doing this in a uh, composite structure, we don't have to worry so much about the mechanical um, robustness uh, uh, support um, that a freestanding membrane we need to have. So this allows us to really play around with um, in terms of the kinds of materials you can add and going to extremely high um, solids loading to get that intrinsic performance from those metal organic frameworks to come out, not just simply be dominated by the polymer material. So in the interest of time, just quickly so that one of the interesting is adding uh, these, these uh, particles not only increases the performance, but also in terms of compression, we, don't, we actually can show some rigidification of the coatings. They, uh, without the nanoparticles, we get hysteresis. When we pressurize and depressurize, when we add these particles, we, do, we get much more greater uh, stability. 
So we are taking some of these membranes out to, this is um, a, the flue gas uh, a power plant where we're actually going to test some of these membranes with real flue gas in, in the coming uh, six, to, six months to a year. So I'm going to just finally finish up by just talking about saying so that mixed matrix membrane gives you one um, lever. How about we, but it still has a lot of with, uh, drawbacks. One is incompatibility of the polymer. We can, the limitation particle loadings. So can we get around that by saying, well, let's just make a layer that is fully, that is framework material. So, oops. So we want to now think about in situ formation of moss on porous membrane substrate. Now, this is not uh, a new thing. People have been able to create moth layers on inorganic substrates, also in polymeric substrates, and also by contradiffusion. Right? But in many of the cases, that is very, very thick, and therefore you lose many of the advantages of, a, of the uh, framework material. So we thought about a way that we can actually overcome that, say, look, let's make the surface um, really compatible and also provide the right environment to nucleate those framework materials and form those in situ. So what we did was actually took those lovely uh, uh, titanium-coated surfaces and functionalized uh, uh, silane groups, and those groups can actually chelate the metal coordinating centers and actually grow the metal-organic frameworks in situ. So they provide the hierarchical roughness that allows you to key in those uh, growth of those crystals, but also allows them to grow evenly and smooth. In fact, and we were able to do that, make a coordinated, um, uh, sorry, a coherent metal-organic coating onto a, a polymer substrate. So this is not under any very severe kind of, we basically take the, the hollow fiber membrane and we just coat with a titanium coated fiber membrane and just throw in the precursors for the, the uh, uh, ZIF-8 and basically forms in situ. No high temperature, this is a room temperature, this is uh, no soluble thermal um, processing, just simple reaction in situ. So we can see the form seeding, growth of this crystal and coherency. So, this allows us to grow ultra-thin layers and allows us to achieve basically molecular sieving at ultra-high permeation. This is for one of the highest reported CO2 permeate, uh, permeances reported for these sorts of mineral organic framework uh, membranes. So basically we can show that we go from Newton diffusion to molecular sieving. Selectivity is still not that, is, is basically representative of the pure ZIF-8. The, permeate, uh, the permeance um, is, I say, one is extremely high. And what's interesting is when we back calculated the, the permeance with versus uh, Chorus's group's uh, calculation evaluation of ZIF-8 permeability, we are basically in that right ballpark. So if, basically, we're making a half micron ZIF-8 thickness, and it has pretty much the same selectivity as for hydrogen and CO2. For some of the other pairs, it's not exactly um, pure as if eight behavior. And we think it's well, some of the issues is that remember we have a basically flex, flexible substrate which may cause some, some flexing of the uh, ZIF-8 coating. So this layer is say, it's not fragile. It can actually bend a little bit because of those, um, uh, because it's ultra thin. And I said ZIF-8 does have some flex in, in the structure. Now, we can actually play the same game again in terms of saying, well, how else can we add catechol uh, and amine groups to nucleate those metal organic framework materials? Well, we can add things like polydopamine and polyethylamine, and that form a very nice adhesive surface, and then, again, chelating those metal, uh, metal uh, centers. And in this case, we simply coat it with PDA, PDI, and then, again, throw in the precursors for the ZIF-8, and they form spontaneously on, on the surface. So the PEI makes a much more even coating compared to just the, using polydopamine, for example. And we can see, again, we get uh, high permeances, about half of what we got with the titania coated surface, but we still get molecular sieving. And we here for helium, hydrogen, um, and CO2 separation. So, very, very high, uh, but ultra, but very, very, uh, still very, very thin layers. 
Interesting, we wanted to be sure that we can have stability, so different fee pressures, uh, number of days. So this is quite a stable um, ZIF-8 structure. What's interesting is we compare the two types of mineral the moth layers we get from the titanium coated and the PDA, PDEI coated. They're slightly different. Um, we, get, we think that there's a little bit more potential different crystal structure of the ZIF-8 that forms out of those coatings. And that, Maybe because of the types of uh, chemical groups that we have introduced on the surface and the density of chemical groups that we have on the surface. So where does that take us in terms of what else can we do with this? Well, one of the things is now you can think about that uh, we can now coat polymer membranes with ligands that can generate a site framework materials on demand, so to speak. And that allows us not to just coat flat sheets, but hollow fibers. Um, and we can literally print metal organic framework films. So we can put, print the PDA, PDI pattern, and we can actually grow the metal organic framework materials off polymers, other types of substrates. Um, so that's some of the work that we're doing. We're also functionalizing some of those metal organic frameworks with enzymes. It's a talk for another day, but if you want to come speak to me later about it, it's quite interesting. But I want to finish off by saying about printing. So we talk about membranes for separation. So one of the ideas that we have are looking at, let's print metal organic framework material by putting this PDA, PDI, um, right? and we can actually grow them into order arrays. And they have some really interesting uh, optical properties. So one of the things we're thinking in the future, could we on a membrane be able to print metal organic framework, not just for separation, but also encapsulating cat, uh, catalyst particles, encapsulating enzymes, and be able to make sensors and microfluidic um, devices out of them. So with that, I want to finish up by thanking, uh, basically acknowledging the huge amount of work from my research team. Um, uh, Jing Wei Hu, who's, who's here, did a lot of the work uh, in terms of the uh, uh, nanomaterials integration with membranes, the graphene oxide, the metal organic framework. Uh, Lin Li has worked on the pervaporation, and my other students uh, have worked on both the gas separation side as well as work on the titanium functionalization of, of surfaces. And also acknowledge my MOF colleagues uh, at the University of Sydney, uh, Deanna DeSandro, who was uh, instrumental in giving us the work on the defect engineered uh, Mill 53 work. So, and of course, we got to thank people who pay support this research. So with that, I want to uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions.